Welcome to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki. The latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Sitting in for Bob Bennis, here's Father Paul Hartman. Good morning and welcome to Living Our Faith on Relevant Radio. My name is Father Paul Hartman. I am the Judicial Vicar of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee and President at Catholic Memorial High School in Waukesha, Wisconsin. It is an honor to sit in this week for Bob Bennis, but it is most important that I introduce to you the true host of this show, the guide and the shepherd of the diocese, Archbishop Jerome Lestecki. Archbishop thank, Lestecki, thanks, welcome. Father Paul, thank you very much. Thank you. This week, we have, uh, in the coming week, some wonderful celebrations. We have uh, one of the first great celebrations. Halloween. We have Halloween. Well, that <laughs> It'll be a little longer, a little longer. Talk about the little celebrations which touch your... Well, your see, the problem, Hall- the problem with Halloween <laughs> is the candy never makes it to actual <laughs> Halloween. But uh, tomorrow we have the, the Feast of Great uh, St. John Paul. Oh, so. sure. I'm glad you said that, Great, because uh, truly um, um, uh, Francis' predecessor, uh, Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, then later, obviously, Benedict XVI, always referred to his predecessor as the Great, John Paul the Great. And uh, you know, when you think about it, there was only there was only a, three greats in the history of the uh, of the church. Three popes who were great. I pray and I hope it, uh, at some time uh, before the end of uh, Pope Francis's reign, he will declare him officially to be. I think great. you have referred to yourself as a John as the Paul great? Bishop. <laughs> no, I, I have. You leave that to others, sir. Uh, <laughs> but you've referred to yourself as a as a John Paul Bishop. I refer to myself as a John Paul priest. Uh, it truly was impactful on his, for generations to come. Sure, his um, his his life, his twenty six years, was uh, such an imprint, left such an imprint on the church. Uh, it's just remarkable. I, you know as well as I do, um, uh, priests that we're in contact with will readily say they they literally found their way towards the priesthood um, because of the of the teaching or the witnessing of uh, of John Paul II. So such a, a, a phenomenal and. You know, Paul, I just have to tell you that um, um, my early uh, days my um, in Rome were, were his early days as, as a pope. So I was there from 79 to 83. But I was, I was just dropped off visitors in the square the day he was shot. Oh I left God. them about uh, 35 minutes, sat down, opened up my book because I, I had um, uh, basically an uh, exam. And somebody came running in the room and said, the pope has been shot. You know, so and, and later we know it was Ali Aja, uh, who, who um, basically then was arrested and in prison. Mm-hmm. And one of the most profound um, pictures was that picture. I, I believe it was Time Magazine that had it on the, on the cover of the the Pope meeting with when he first, visited with him when yeah. he visited with him in prison. Well, that's one of the great impactful mm-hmm. realities of Pope John Paul is that he was so clearly going out and he was going from and the places he went. Uh, whether they were countries, whether they were settings, uh, it truly reflected what uh, an apostolic church should be. And in so many ways, he had these little things that we didn't see until after the fact. They weren't the great voyages. They weren't World Youth Days. When he went to Aliaja's prison, when he went to the prisons around Rome for the different prayer services and the different events. Truly a reflection of what today Francis would call living out the works of mercy and in his year of mercy. And you're doing some of the same things in this year of mercy. There's a, a particular vision that was uh, that was incorporated by the archdiocese to, to make sure that there was a, a an optics for everyone to be able to see and to basically to use me as a focal point of that optic, celebrating um, uh, the corporal works of mercy. Um, uh, feed the hungry, um, um, give give uh, give shelter to the homeless, uh, um, clothed and naked. Whereas just um, just a, a few weeks ago, I was at um, um, Saint Vincent de Paul, um, and then of course there's one that kind of like grates on us a little bit that I I did a, a, a few months ago, and that's visit the imprisoned. You know, uh, there's almost kind of a, a sense of why should we visit these people who are condemned? Well, it's there's an inner conflict about what mercy means and what justice means and how they're to be lived out. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity in this episode of Living Our Faith. We have a guest who works with prison ministry, Ron Zellinger. Zeilinger. Zeilinger, I apologize. Right. Welcome. You work in uh, prison ministry and and you have a great event coming up. Why don't you tell us about yourself, the organization you work for, and the ministry that you uh, perform? All right. Thank you, for first of all, for having me on the program. I really appreciate it, the opportunity. 
to talk about something that uh, we feel quite passionate about. Um, Dismas Ministry, uh, and the website is that same name, just .org, uh, if anyone wants to go and check out some more information, um, began in the year 2000 during that Jubilee year. And it was prior to that that uh, we did a little bit of a survey of as many folks as we could find that were in Catholic prison ministry. And we asked them, what would you need and what do you think uh, the inmates in your care would need? And they just said, free Bibles, free prayer material. And if you have any study courses like the Protestants have, you know, they always have Bible study courses, you know, that would be wonderful if you could offer that. So that really formed the basic program or the platform for Dismas Ministry. And we haven't varied from that over the 15 years, now going on 16 years that the, that the organization's been here, uh, situated in the Archdiocese. And uh, first as a pilot project and then grew to become national. So we serve prisons, chaplains, and inmates in every state of the Union. Now, Ryan, for the Mm -hmm. sake of our our listeners who may not be Christian or or, or Catholic, Mm -hmm. why Dismas? Yeah, it's not a it's not a scriptural uh, name. It, it's from a very ancient oral tradition. I think the name shows up maybe in the four or five hundreds in some of the church fathers' literature and so on. Um, it's an interesting name. It's applied to the good thief that uh, died next to Jesus, but before he died, pled for mercy and received it from our Lord. Mm-hmm. And and uh, Jesus said, "This day you will be with me in paradise." So it's one of those great um, iconic moments where. Uh, inmates even today can read that story in Luke and uh, realize that it's never too late. They can have a, a conversion and, and uh, turn to the mercy of God. Um, but the I did a little research uh, on, on the Greek roots of that name, and it literally means a sinking or a lowering. It would be like the sun setting or a ship sinking beneath the waters, but also it could be someone, if you're familiar with how someone dies with suffocation during crucifixion, they begin to sink and they can't raise themselves up and then they they are smothered really uh, as their their chest constricts. And so whoever thought of the name Dismas for this good thief, uh, I mean, they they seem to have a very apt name for this man. So it certainly yeah. has developed over a, a period of time. Kind of the the sense and even a little spirituality around Dismas yes. as a as a figure for reaching out to those who suddenly find themselves imprisoned or yeah. looking for basically the uh, the mercy of the Lord uh, yeah. during a difficult time in their lives. It's an amazing conversion story. And if you read Luke, it's just within ten verses that he goes from cursing Jesus with the other criminal on the other side. To turning to him and giving his life over to this, and I always say it's a, it seems to be a miracle of faith because Jesus is a battered, you know, uh, tortured person hanging next to him, and how uh, you know the good thief could put his faith in this person next to him and and see the divine in him is is to me an and absolute re- miracle of grace. Rebuking the other thief, yes, who fails to recognize the uh, faith, the, uh, the innocence and the. The Redeemer, who now right. is being crucified, right. even right. becomes an advocate for right. Jesus. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Which is yeah. Cool. And you spoke earlier the discomfort we have as a general society about prison ministry. The good thief said, "We're here justly, mm-hmm. but mercy is still available to us." So it's that mm-hmm. the conversion is not some sort of, you know, let's let's ignore what's happened. It's the conversion ba- based on. A true resurrection, a true rising up above what had happened in their lives. Now, Ryan, mm-hmm. obviously, um, you didn't you didn't start off. You weren't in high school or college and say, you know what, I want to go to the prisons and work with with those who are in prison. How did how did you come to your own understanding? How did how did that how did that evolve? That that type of ministry and that um, uh, type of outreach evolve in your own life. Well, there's an element of mystery to it, and that's with any calling or or charism, I think, that you feel you have received from the Lord that is a gift. Um, I have always been for the marginalized and the outcast, and so prison ministry seemed to also spark an interest in me. And it came out of my working with Priest of the Sacred Heart out in Hale's Corners uh, when I realized uh, that there was a need and that this was something very close to the heart of Jesus. I, at that, uh, from my training with the Priest of the Sacred Heart, I, I really appreciated uh, devotion to the heart of Jesus. I thought, this is something that, um, you know, I think... Uh, we as Christians need to do and listen to the words of our Lord. You know, Matthew 25, 
I was in prison. And so Jesus very closely associates himself with prisoners. And when we think that God chose to reveal himself in this way as a crucified um, person on Calvary uh, as subject to death penalty, but also to identify with prisoners, we as Christians and as Catholics, we can hardly miss the point that God's trying to make with us that we need to pay attention to the outcast as well. You know. Ron, Archbishop, we're going to take a break in a minute for Catholic Herald headlines for school news from throughout the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. We'll be back in a short time. We'll talk about the Archbishop's vision for this specialized ministry within the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, both as it serves the prisoners, the imprisoned, but how it impacts all of our parish communities near and far. But we will focus on this year of mercy and the gift that faith gives to those imprisoned. We'll be back in a short time. Here's American Landscape founder Terrell Hughes and second generation owner son Shay Hughes. Growing up, I was blessed to watch how my father started and cultivated his landscape business. I learned about helping people and creating yardscapes that brought them joy. This is a 40 year tradition that continues here at American Landscape. Back in the early 70s, we built the company from the ground up, right down to our red trucks. I knew that if I created a successful business, I could employ people and help them succeed and provide for their families, which many years later I realized was my vocation. And so we do have much to be thankful for. As a second-generation owner, I am proud to carry on the vision and the principles my father taught me over the years. We would love to help you create a beautiful yardscape that will bring you this same joy. Since 1973, American Landscape has been serving residential and commercial property owners with certified professionals. Go to RelevantRadio.com, keyword landscape. Good morning. I'm Grace David with news from the Archdiocese of Milwaukee Catholic Schools. On Friday, October 14th, all of our Catholic schools were closed. The reason? Our 2,500 teachers and leaders traveled to Milwaukee for the 2016 Educators Convention. Joining us were the teachers from the Diocese of Madison. The convention was full of vendors, professional development speakers, and experts from around the nation. Keynote speaker was Dr. Martin Scanlon, who talked about structure and storytelling in Catholic schools. He said, Our most powerful stories are about who we are. He closed his speech telling teachers, be ambitious, be humble. God bless all our teachers for the work they do. We hope this day was productive as well as inspiring. The Souls Walk for Catholic Education, held at Mount Mary University on October 15th, was a success. The morning was filled with smiling faces, school spirit, and respectful prayer as our 108 Catholic schools gathered to raise tuition money and awareness that Catholic education is alive and thriving. Our highest participating school was St. Joseph in Big Bend. In addition to the great number of walkers, they also collected 274 shoes for St. Vincent de Paul and raised $3,500 for their tuition angel fund. Congratulations to St. Joseph and all our schools who are spreading the good news across 10 counties in southeastern Wisconsin. Now with headlines from the Catholic Herald and catholicherald.org. It's not an issue you'll hear discussed or read about in the media or on the campaign trail, but you'll hear about it from Archbishop Lestecki in this week's Catholic Herald and at catholicherald.org. The topic is anti-Catholicism, a bias, the Archbishop writes, that is evident in this year's presidential campaign. The Archbishop's Herald of Hope column is must-reading for every Catholic voter prior to Election Day. You're invited to a birthday party at the Cathedral this Tuesday, October 25th, for... It's organ. This week's Catholic Herald and CatholicHerald.org tell the story of how this organ, originally being built for a church in California, found a home in Milwaukee's cathedral in fall of 1966. With All Souls Day slightly more than a week away, it's a good time to think about end-of-life concerns and how you are preparing for them. That's why Our Lady of Lords Parish is hosting Fare Thee Well on Saturday, October 29th from 9 a.m. until noon. In this week's Catholic Herald and at catholicherald.org, read about this first-of-its-kind event and why the parish is sponsoring it. And mark your calendar for Saturday, November 5th. It's the day of the Archdiocese's first VIP event. VIP stands for Very Important Parishes, and this week's Catholic Herald and catholicherald.org provide details about the event and feature the four parishes that will participate. 
time doesn't permit me to tell you about all you'll find in the Catholic Herald and at catholicherald.org, but believe me, they offer plenty to read. Until next time, this is Grace David. Thank you for listening. We now return you to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Listecki. Welcome back to Living Our Faith on Relevant Radio. My name is Father Paul Hartman. I am the Judicial Vicar of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee and President at Catholic Memorial High School in Waukesha, Wisconsin. The Archbishop is here this morning. We're talking about the great work of prison ministry, and it's interesting. I know a story from the Archbishop's history. When was the first time you had a significant visit to a prison? Yeah, the significant vision, uh, visit to prison was uh, probably 1966, 67, and uh, the basketball team was invited to play uh, against uh, the Michigan State Maximum Security Prison. I mean, these were... This was not, uh, and this is your seminary. Prison. This is your seminary, this is seminary basketball right. team. So this was not. This was not a country club. Uh, what they referred to as, as country club prison. This was <laughs> white collar crimes. These were basically hardened criminals. And um, uh, we were, um, in fact, when we came in, we had to put all of our uh, gym equipment on one side of a trough, and then the guards came in and put us up against basically the the screen, and they went through meticulous went through everything that we had in uh, our gym bags you know so i mean like our jocks you know those type things you know and then 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 the pat down for us then 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 basically before we were allowed just basically come in and then we went through metal detectors and everything so so you know the the, the actual sense of uh, of confinement was uh, was really a and as, as we've spoken just the sense a lot of priests i've gone into different prisons settings and that level of scrutiny that level of search is is surprising it's it's disturbing much less than to be in that situation 24 7 so i think ron what was your first experience that led you into prison work uh, first experience was at racine correctional and uh we were going down for mass and uh one of the things that still stays with me from that visit was, you know, yes, to encounter the inmates and how appreciative and respectful they were that, that to have somebody come and, and join them, you know, for worship. But walking with um, the correctional officer down the hall, we had a moment where it was just the two of us, and um, he just offhand mentioned that, uh, yeah, I've been in here longer than most of these prisoners. And it well, struck me, I thought, that is so true, you know, that uh, month after month, year after year, you know, these these correctional officers are there doing their job. And it can be stressful, but sometimes it's just plain tedious, and, you know, it it's, um, it's a job they do for the community. So I always put in a plug for correctional officers that they also need a, a ministerial, uh, you know, touch, you know, when behind right. bars. So, you're, yeah. You're right. And obviously, you're, this is the right word, appreciation for what goes on in a prison mm-hmm. and your assessment of of various prison uh, activities probably has grown over the years. Mm-hmm. So you have, um, you're, in your own sense, you have pretty much um, um, either destroyed some preconceived notions, but also have come to understand a little bit of the um, of the power impact of some of the things that actually happen mm-hmm. in prison life. Would you kind of share some of those with us? Um, well, I, I've had opportunity to be um, a, a baptismal sponsor for two men as well, and that's always been you know very touching and to continue that relationship with them over the years. Um, but uh, I think it's the I call it the ministry in reverse. It's when you are have been present there, and then uh, you you feel that graciousness, that acceptance, that gratitude of the inmates, you know, and you think it doesn't take much, you know. Uh, yeah, at first when you enter the prison and the the gate, you know, closes behind you, and you hear the metal and all that, you think, well, I'm really in here. This, you know, this is real. But um, but then when you begin to talk to the men, it's it's um, and I, I, we could say women as well. Um, it's uh, they're very much human beings, and uh, the the least little thing they appreciate, um, you know, when we hand them a free Bible that's brand new, a prayer book, those kind of things. Um, I mean, it can re- literally bring them to tears that someone on the outside cares for them. So Do we find um, in in the prison population, um, especially during our time now, during this day and age, uh, a, 
a greater sense of those who are emotionally disturbed incarcerated that it may be in a, in a different type of evaluation wouldn't necessarily be put um, into prison but rather maybe into some type of um, in, uh, for institutional help yeah I think that's uh, one of the situations that you can uh, read about or research is that um, our prisons do house a lot of mentally ill people and um, it it may not be the best place for them to be you know rehabilitated or cured Um, also we house a lot of um, drug addicts and alcoholics and so whether they get treatment or not is also the other question you know so and and I that kind of brings up also the issue of our prisons being at this point in the history of the U.S. probably more punitive and warehousing than they are uh, rehabilitative. We have uh, prisons that have very few programs and just seem to warehouse people and keep them until it's time for release again. And when I talk to people on the outside, I say, as a society, you have to ask the question, what do we want these people to be like when they get out? But if they get nothing while they're in, you know, then we have a situation that we really need to look at as a society. So, And the other issue is um, something that I've become increasingly aware of is the impact of solitary confinement on inmates. Um, this is a horrific practice. It's been designated by the U.N. as torture, and yet it's uh, frequently used throughout our U.S. prison system, uh, sometimes just as an easy way to um, reprimand you know, a prisoner who needs uh, reprimanding. But, um, but the length of time that it goes on sometimes is months upon years and years, and it truly induces mental illness rather than any kind of cure or help for that individual. So it's something that, again, as a society, I think we're called to take a look at. Ron, I know you want to talk about the what's coming up, the inaugural National Catholic Prison Ministry Conference. Yes. And I think, you know, a couple moments on that. And then uh, maybe a call. What do parishioners in the, in the pews, in the parishes, what are some of the things they can do for the imprisoned? Okay. Uh, Yeah, we're very excited. We have uh, coming up on November 10th and 11th right here at the Archbishop Cousins Center. Uh, We're going to have a National Catholic Prison Ministry Conference, and we've called it Concluding the Year of Mercy Behind Bars. We had hoped to get it as close as we could to November 6th, which is designated by Pope Francis as the Day of uh, Prayer for Prisoners. And so um, it's pretty close to that, that event. But we have um, a good line of speakers. We have um, a woman, Jean Bishop, who's from, she's a public defender in Cook County, Illinois. And uh, her pregnant sister and her husband were murdered by a young man, and she has since reconciled with this young man. And she goes around talking about that, uh, the ability to reconcile with uh, um the perpetrator, but also she's advocating for the, an end to the death penalty. We've got Father Greg Boyle, who's founder and director of Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles. He's working with youth at risk, youth in gangs, and people coming out of prisons to give them a start. Uh, Amalia Molina was herself incarcerated uh, with the uh, immigration um, uh, system in California, unjustly so, but her and her husband were finally released after 18 months while their children were still trying to maintain the home. And she herself now has gone into assisting families so that they can visit their loved ones in prison. So she's not become a bitter person, but has turned it around in a loving way. Uh, Father George Williams is a Jesuit who is also the chaplain of San Quentin Prison. And um, he'll talk about, again, the death penalty, death row, et cetera. And Elena Segura is the director of the Office of Immigrant Affairs and Immigration Education for the Archdiocese of Chicago. And she'll talk about this whole immigration experience that our society's currently going through as well. So we've got quite a nice lineup. And I didn't mention Sister Helen Prejean, who I think most people know yeah, Yeah. from Dead Man Man Walking. Walking. Yeah, There's just a couple minutes left. What are some of the points that a parish can take on? I I think, first of all, pray. I mean, the power of prayer, uh, we have uh, on our website uh, a union of prayer that people can sign up for. But otherwise, just, you know, please bring that up in the prayer of the faithful. Remind our parishes that we do have members of the body of Christ behind bars. They need our prayers. And there are real conversions taking place. And I think the spirit working with the power of prayer behind that is is something. The Archbishop and I, uh, the Archbishop presided just recently at a funeral uh, for... 
retired uh, federal judge, Rudolph Randa, mm -hmm. and the wonderful story that uh, one of the eulogies gave about his remaining in contact with one of the one of the a man that he sentenced to 10 mm -hmm. or 11 years or more in mm -hmm. prison and the correspondence that led to the man's conversion that led to the man's yes. own statement of faith was really yeah. a very touching reality about the power of one person's prayer yes. upon another yeah very much so um, i mean that people are able to write letters to inmates but that has to be a very in a very controlled and careful way done so that nothing nothing personal of their own address is given out so there's a vehicle uh, for that to happen. Um, people certainly can contribute to any um, of the prison ministries out there. Um, but if they want to visit, I think their their best chance is get someone who's already doing it, have them uh, be able to shadow with that person going in, get a feel for it, see if it really is for them. I always say there's lots of works of mercy, and prison ministry may not be the one that you need to get involved well, in, but you need very to check it out, priests. too, as well. It's you know, so. One of the things uh, that, that, that I came in contact with uh, with some uh, prison chaplains is the, the questioning of the sentencing laws mm -hmm. that— uh, are in effect that mm -hmm. tie the hand of the of the judges yes that can make it a discern when it's a mandatory sentence mm -hmm. they they have they have no choice if the person is found mm -hmm. guilty they have to exact uh, uh, this without leaving right. anything for the as we said before the ability to understand is this person able to be rehabilitated right. is, or discretion, or or the discretion yeah. I think that's, that's one of the most unfortunate aspects in our system right now is that judges' hands are tied and sometimes I think it's really important for them to be able to flex a little bit with what needs to be done for this individual case, you know, and the Obviously, one of the that's another thing to add to the list is advocacy, learning the issues, learning the situation, yes. and, and determining what in our faith we can do for others. We've got to come to a break now uh, for before our final little segment of prayer. But uh, thank you all for listening. This is Living Our Faith on Relevant Radio. Here's American landscape founder Terrell Hughes and second generation owner son Shea Hughes. We love creating yardscapes for customers. Our professional landscape architects, designers, and horticulturalists are always available to schedule time to visit your property. Spending time with you going over the landscape and hearing your thoughts, we create the yardscapes that bring joy. You know, it takes talented, hardworking, dedicated people to create beautiful and impactful yardscapes. It's like painting a picture. From simple solutions to elegant design, we understand that every site has unique requirements. The ultimate goal is creative, distinctive spaces that reflect the client's personal style while working in context and scale with the architecture and surrounding environment. Since 1973, American Landscape has been serving residential and commercial property owners with certified professionals. Go to RelevantRadio.com, keyword landscape. Welcome back to Living Our Faith on Relevant Radio. My name is Father Paul Hartman here with Archbishop Lestecki, and we've had a wonderful conversation about prison ministry and, and the great effort that we should put into it during this year of mercy and well beyond. And thank you, Ryan. Thanks for your ministry. Thanks for allowing people to... Um, to be made aware and their conscience be raising uh, because of what you, what you're doing. So we thank you. Ask God's blessing to continue yeah. on in your work. Uh, but so in this being the year, year of mercy, let us say say together the prayer that Pope Francis gave us for the jubilee year of mercy. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, you, you have, have taught, taught us to be merciful, merciful like, like the heavenly Father. Father. You and have, have told, told us that, that whoever sees you, you sees him. him. Let, Let the church be your visible face in the world. Send your spirit so that the jubilee of mercy may be a year of grace from the Lord and your church with renewed enthusiasm. Bring good news to the poor. Proclaim liberty to captives and the oppressed and restore sight to the blind. We ask this through the intercession of Mary, Mother of Mercy, you who live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. And Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and with, with your, your spirit. spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now and forever. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made, who made heaven, heaven and earth. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop, and thank you to our listeners on Relevant Radio. This has been Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki. Join us again next week for the latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee.
Faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee.